All right, historians, welcome back. Today we are discussing 20th century Arizona. So that's the whole span of the 1900s. But since Arizona wasn't a state until 1912, we really start to look at Arizona history in like the 19 teens until about the 1990s. In the next lesson, we'll learn about 21st century Arizona. So really turn of the century from the 1990s to the early 2000s and into contemporary state history. So there's a lot to cover today, but we're going to do it in a different way. Um, I'll give you a little bit of information, and then I'm actually going to introduce you to some sources that may be of interest to you. All right, 20th century Arizona. Let's start with some terms that will be relevant once you start getting into the literature. I thought I'd give you kind of a introduction or a heads up on some of the content or terms that you'll be hearing. So the first is this concept of interwar America. So like I said, since we're covering the whole of the 20th century, but really Arizona doesn't become a state until the 19 teens, we can kind of look at the first period of the 20th century from the interwar lens. Now, historians use this term interwar to really reference the uh, period between and kind of encompassing World War I and World War II. So we're really looking at anything from about the 1910 era, 1912, 1914, to about the end of the 1930s. You can, for our purposes, stretch that into the early 1940s when America enters World War II. But a lot happens in that interwar period, a lot. So in the 1910s, it's really kind of the final vestiges of sort of outdated, old-fashioned in terms of style, um, early American kind of Victorian modes or um, mores. And instead, you start to see the rise of like progressive politics, more social services. And as we lean into the 1920s, an emphasis is on kind of like a new visibility for women, uh, particularly white women and middle class women. You also see in the 1910s, the beginning of the great migration of African-Americans leaving the American South in droves for urban places like New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia, but also Western places like California, Arizona, and Colorado. So you've got a lot happening in the 1910s. And then by the 1920s, of course, you might already know that's kind of the era of prohibition, uh, the flappers, speakeasies, like kind of a a wildness to American politics and culture, but it's also a huge literary and artistic movement, but in particular for African Americans. And then in the 1930s, America has just experienced this huge economic boom. And then the 1930s, they slip into a global depression that affects Americans across the country. Uh, and so when we look at the interwar period, we're looking at sort of those spikes, those peaks and valleys. And then by the 1940s, America enters World War II. You'll also see this term post-war America. This is really the era following America's involvement in World War II. So really from like 1945 until maybe the 1960s, uh, late 1960s. The post-war era is really defined by American affluence. So the country itself, but also individuals living in America have more money than they've ever had before in terms of uh, disbursement of money or ratio of wealth. So this is a time of great wealth for American civil civilians and citizens, but not for everybody. And it's also a time of disillusionment for people who may be fought on behalf of America during World War II and then returned home and didn't get the freedoms and the luxuries that they were almost promised to them. So I'm talking about African-American and Mexican-American veterans who fought in World War II alongside white Americans and then were sort of denied the benefits of their service, that their white compatriots were experiencing and enjoying. So post-war America is also this time of uh, pretty stagnant gender roles, a return to kind of old-fashioned experiences and expectations of women and the home. Uh, but it's also a great time of wealth and celebration and purchasing. Meanwhile, other people aren't experiencing those same things. So think about like your 1950s, early 1960s kind of Mad Men era. Some people were in and lots of people were left out. The post-war era is also defined by the rapid expansion of places throughout America, urban cities like Phoenix, Los Angeles, uh, Denver, Seattle. These are cities that explode on account of the availability of the automobile. 
So you have a growth in like suburbanization and suburban cities from the 1950s on. This term sunbelt. So we've talked a ton in this class about the Southwest. So when I talk about the Southwest, I'm really talking about kind of Arizona, New Mexico, parts of Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and California. But you're going to see this word sunbelt used a lot in this week's uh, lesson, in part because this is a different region, a different regional title that you could look at when you're looking at post-war America. So here are some definitions or designations that represent the sunbelt. A heavy reliance on automobiles. Remember, I mentioned this is the big boom in automobile purchasing, even though, even though cars have been around for about uh, 40 years at this time. Uh, this is when Americans have access to cheaper and more affordable cars. Underfunded social services. So places in the Sun Belt tend to uh, have poor financing of public services like parks, education, uh, roads and bridges, healthcare. These are social, social services that in some places are really well resourced and really well funded. They are typically not in the Sun Belt. Sun Belt. This is also a space of low density urbanization. So high density meaning kind of um, vertical. Think of like skyscrapers in New York City, like you've lots of people in one area and it's all stacked on top of each other. So urbanization in the Sun Belt is sprawled out more. So low density urbanization means that there's still a lot of people, but they're spread out a little bit more. Uh, sluggish responses to concerns within minority communities. So throughout the Sun Belt, we see the government and other um, sources of support not really responding to concerns among people of color, African Americans, Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans. And you know, through this class, we've learned that these are people who've been in Phoenix and Arizona for the whole of the history. And you'll see that city council and state legislators don't typically respond quickly or well to concerns that are brought up with these groups. There's a preference in the Sun Belt among government officials for efficient kind of business-like government. So making money, managing money well, and making decisions quickly. This is not typically a democratic process. And then finally, something defining the South or the Sun Belt is a mania for low taxes. And we will see that as Phoenix in particular evolves through the 20th century, you have places like Sun City, which is founded on the belief that People elsewhere, the Midwest typically, have paid their taxes, they've put their kids through school, and now they just want to retire in paradise and they don't want to have to pay taxes because they pay, tax, they pay taxes their whole lives. They already did that. So they want to go somewhere that's free of taxes. This is also true when it comes to these places attracting corporations saying that you won't have to pay a lot of taxes here. It's not that expensive to do business in Arizona. Another term that I like to use is considered, it's called magic lands. Now you're not going to see this in the literature a lot, but it's something I wanted to talk to you about today before I get into your challenge. So the concept of magic lands was designed by a man in the 1990s called uh, John Finley. And in it, he compares Disneyland to Sun City, which I know sounds like a completely wild comparison. Uh, how are the two connected? But he defines this idea of magic lands in the American West in particular as pro-growth. These are places that are promoting, always growing. If you think about the way, if you were to turn on the local news, the way they talk about, you know, bringing jobs and people and development and construction and all of these things into Phoenix, this is a pro-growth model. Magic lands like Sun City, Disneyland, the Space Needle, um, you know, all of these places attract white, middle class, and upper class transplants from the Midwest. So these are places that are attracting outsiders, typically who have money and typically who are white. These places are defined by new technology and things like defense, innovation, power. Uh, so think about, you know, the Palo Verde power station out in the West Valley. Uh, the fact that this was the home of Motorola before before cell phones were really common, Motorola was among the first companies to develop that. Uh, Boeing, right? The Litchfield Park Air Force Base, like all of these things are connected to technology, but also military. Finley calls these regional economies. These typically mean um, 
both kind of the Southwest as a region, but also think about how Phoenix in general, the Phoenix metropolitan area is one big giant sprawl, but each kind of little village has its own regional identity. So Central Phoenix is very different from South Phoenix, Paradise Valley, Scottsdale, Levine, Chandler, Mesa, Goodyear, all of these places have kind of their own separate identity and their own separate economic structure. Uh, Finley references this kind of particular vision of social mores, and this typically comes with people who are transplants, they're new, but they identify other people that are just like them and they wanna live among those folks and they wanna share those same cultural values. Again, with advanced innovations in aviation and space and weaponry, uh, petrochemicals, computers, electronics, really anything that is meant to master the resources of these wild lands like the desert or lack thereof. So one of the things you might be looking at is like, how in the world is Phoenix managing this humongous growth in population with a depletion of water resources? There's a cultural cachet to these magic lands and an emphasis on consumerism or purchasing. So I'm just gonna give you a couple examples of magic lands and then I'm gonna sort of juxtapose that with the realities. The first is the Grand Canyon, which early 1919 was established as one of the first parks in American history. And this was, I mean, 20th century, but a long time ago, right? This was really seen as an opportunity for early 20th century tourism, which was promoted mostly among Europeans and wealthy white Americans. And what made the Grand Canyon accessible to these folks was um, the railroad and access to new cars or more cars. And what they saw in the Grand Canyon was kind of the preservation and wildness of America's rugged landscape, and also what they believed was kind of the dying off of old America, including Native American people. Now we know Native American people did not go extinct. They are living among us, right? And they, they are part of the American fabric. But in the 20th century, they were almost exoticized to the point, or romanticized to the point where white tourists were going to places like the Grand Canyon to kind of see and experience uh, the wilderness of Native American lives. Uh, so it was seen as this magic land, right? It was attracting those outsiders. It was attracting wealth and it was promoting things like new technologies and innovation like the automobile or the railroad. Another thing I wanted to tell you about are the Harvey girls. Now this is the same kind of era, like early 1900s, late 1800s. These are typically white young women who were recruited by a man named Fred Harvey to staff hotels and restaurants all along the railroad so that when white tourists coming to places like the Grand Canyon felt like they were still safe, right? They were among young women who are not seen as kind of rugged or, or um, sort of dangerous as young men. They were all from Harvey recruited from good family homes. They were all middle-class educated. Most of them were under the age of 30. Most of them were in their early twenties. So these women kind of represented the East Coast, those social mores, that cultural cachet, but sort of safely plotted along things, along places like the San Francisco Railroad. So if you wanted to go to the Grand Canyon, not to worry, you will see a friendly face, someone else who, is, who looks like you, looks like back home. That's how it was promoted. Now, I know you watching this in the 21st century, probably, you know, based in somewhere in the Southwest, you're like, that's not me. I'm not, I'm, I'm sort of speaking rhetorically. Another kind of magic land in a lot of ways is the Hoover Dam. So the Hoover Dam is built during the Great Depression. Uh, it's one of the first ways that the government responds to the Great Depression and helps to put about uh, a couple hundred men to work in the produ production of a dam on the Colorado River. Now the Colorado River provides water and electricity to the majority of the American Southwest. So this place was designed as like an organic machine, a way to control the waters of the Colorado so that civilization could grow in places like Phoenix. But you know, they didn't just build a dam, they built a landmark, they built a tourist trap. You know, they built lookout towers and bridges and a way for Americans, like you can see this at the dedication, a way for Americans to experience this marvel in technology uh, and kind of see it as entertainment as well. 
So remember I told you that Finley compares Sun City to Disneyland. So it's this whole concept he has, but in the post-war period, so after World War II, Sun City, which is at the time, like way out west and north from downtown Phoenix, the only way to get there was Grand Avenue. And it would take like an hour and a half to get there from Sky Harbor Airport. It was a retirement community. It wasn't the first, but it's often touted as one of the first. The retirement community for people over the age of 50, 55, uh, and it was all centered around like church, golf courses, and social experiences and excursions for older white people of the Midwest. Now, this was a grand planned community, and the intention was to attract people who had money, uh, who wanted a lifestyle, right, who wanted a luxurious lifestyle, but maybe couldn't afford to have more of an extravagant retirement. So it was like a way of creating like like an, a, an affordable luxury, but it was marketed as expensive so that really only wealthy white people believed, or at least affluent white people believed that they could have access to this. It was still a segregated place in a lot of ways. Now, the reason Finley compares this to Disneyland is he really looks at like the organization of people. So like Disneyland, if you ever were to go, it's like a, a master in design of how to move people around the park for a day. And Disneyland promises happiness and joy for a day. Sun City promises happiness and joy for the better years of your life, right? Your retirement life. And just like Disneyland, Sun City is organized in a very pleasing way to kind of get around, especially by golf cart. But these are the magic lands. What about the realities in 20th century Arizona? Now, here are some things you might be reading about this week. One of the things that happens in the post-war or in the interwar period is Japanese internment in Arizona. Now, during World War II, Japan is the country that initially gets America into World War II. Not Germany, not the Nazis. Japan bombs America in uh, the 1940s. And as a result, the American government responds by claiming that all people of Japanese descent, including citizens, including natural born citizens, were a potential threat to the United States and therefore needed to be relocated. So you can see on this map, all of these uh, little dots are assembly centers and all of these little triangles are relocation camps where, and they're kind of bit broken down by if they're temporary, who manage them, et cetera. Well, look at this. Arizona has a lot of detention centers or um, assembly centers or camps. And what they do, what the American government do is they collect, they forcibly remove anyone of Japanese American descent from their settlements, many of them among um, the, the California coast, and relocate them to concentration camps. Now, this isn't a death camp or a work camp like you might have heard the term concentration camp referred to in World War II, but their concentration in the sense that these are folks that are all concentrated together because of a like-minded identity. Now, you may not have known that, but Japanese Americans in, in the World War II period were ostracized, they were seen as a threat, and they were forced to live for several years in really difficult conditions. And there are lots of them that really struggled after the war to reclaim their previous lives. So, Here's an example of someone in South Phoenix who had the same experience. This is George Kishiyama. He was one of the founding um, gardeners who was famous in Arizona for helping to cultivate what be later became known as the Japanese flower gardens on Baseline Road in South Phoenix. Now, Kishiyama was interned. He was interned and others like him in Poston, which you might recognize that name, uh, south of the Gila River. Now, he did eventually return to South Phoenix, and he and the Nakagawas and others became these famous florists who grew these beautiful orchards, beautiful rows and rows and rows of flowers all along the base of the salt um, of the South Mountains. So he, we know, for example, that there's someone from our own community who had that experience. Another reality in Phoenix is that, you know, we have this idea of the post-war boom, like all of these suburban cities that are growing. But in fact, there were a lot of restrictions on people of color and where they could live. This is a modern day picture taken in 2023 of Union Station. And you can see to the uh, just direct south right here, there are railroad tracks. 
Now, in the 1880s, the railroad tracks were used as a barrier that designated anyone of color could not live north of those tracks. Well, that set into motion an entire urban history. That set into motion how everyone kind of grew up where they grew up over the course of the next 50 years. So these are real laws. This isn't just a facto, you know, people kind of living where they want to live. These are real policies written by the city and by the state to limit interaction and integration among different races. So here's an example. One of the people we interviewed recently is a guy named Jimmy Brooks. This is a picture of his aunt and uncle who arrived from, I believe, Oklahoma, and they the only choices they had were to live south of the railroad tracks. For the rest of Jimmy's life, he has lived in South Phoenix. He's 80. So his grand, his uh, aunt and uncle who are featured here, this is the 1930s. So his whole life was South Phoenix. His whole family has a connection to South Phoenix because of the among the first people in his family who arrived here and where they were allowed to live. Now you can trace school restrictions too into the early 20th century in Phoenix. In fact, I believe the first law that was written about school segregation was 1909. So this is Arizona still a territory. It's not even a state yet. And they're already writing laws that are limiting uh, integration. Basically what they said was anytime there were more than eight African-Americans in a neighborhood, there had to be a separate school built for them. Now, this didn't always occur because there wasn't always enough money. Remember, sluggish uh, response, low social services, things like that. So oftentimes, uh, African-American and Mexican-American children were either educated in the basement or in a separate room until 1925 when Carver High School was built. There's also another school in Phoenix called Booker T. Washington, which was an African-American school. This is Lowell Elementary School. It's not there anymore. I mean, it is, but this building isn't there anymore. They rebuilt it. It doesn't look anything like its former glory here featured. And even though these students in the 19, this looks like a 1960s picture, even though these students were older and, and had come about in age after those segregationist policies had been removed or redacted, you know, housing restrictions ultimately led to school restrictions when you really think about it. These kids are going to their neighborhood school up the street they mostly were segregated from the rest of the population. And the reason I like this picture is one of the examples of school restrictions and that underfunded social services theme is that in the 19, I think 80s, maybe 70s, I'll look it up for you. But in the 1970s or 80s, the city of Phoenix bulldozed Lowell School. Now Lowell School could have been a landmark. It was beautiful but the city said it was too expensive to refurbish, so they bulldozed it and they built something that looks nothing like it now. The other schools around the city that had this same look that were built at the same time, the city spent the money to refurbish those schools and their landmarks today. We have examples of this. Like I said, we've interviewed people who can speak to this. Rachel and Manuel Gomez Aranda, they grew up in the Marcos Deniza neighborhood, um, right across the street, really, from the Lowell School. And they talk a lot about how they didn't even really realize that they were being segregated as children in the 1940s, but they were. And here's another example that I want you to consider too. Phoenix is exploding because of highways and uh, freeways and automobiles and that pro-growth, low taxes spirit. Lots of outsiders are coming to Phoenix and the more wealth they had, the further away they wanted to be from the city, city center. So more freeways are being built. Well, there was one particular community called the Okima community that was uh, kind of South Phoenix, sort of on the like 40th Street area uh, near Broadway. And um, there was a freeway built right over there and it was built right over their neighborhood. So houses were bulldozed, people were displaced, and they didn't exactly have opportunities to move elsewhere. This would have been in the 1970s or 80s. And you know what another thing I want to tell you about is that after the World War II, anybody who fought in World War II was granted something something called the GI Bill. And this helped provide some seed money for people to buy houses in this post-war suburban period. But you know what? African-American and Mexican-American GIs who had access to the money, who could get the funds, weren't allowed to buy property in Phoenix because of what was called redlining laws. Now, this meant that, well, there were two reasons, but the realtors who were selling houses weren't showing African-Americans any houses in any neighborhoods other than South Phoenix. So anything south of the tracks for the most part. 
But the second reason is when it comes to redlining, banks were not providing any additional loans. So sure, you had GI bill money, but that's for your down payment. The rest of the loan, no one would finance. So here's another example of someone we've interviewed over the years. A man named Travis Williams, we didn't interview him, we interviewed his son, joined with his friend uh, to create the Williams and Jones Construction Company. And what these guys did, they were the first African-American owned construction company in Arizona. They bought a giant plot of land near Broadway Road and they began building houses by a black company for black residents, for black owners. So there's going to be a ton of stuff that we could cover. I could basically just like go on and on about 20th century Arizona for you. But what I want to do instead is give you your challenge. So here's your challenge. Using the library, you are going to select one of the articles that I discuss. You're going to hunt that article down and then you're going to read and evaluate the article. Okay. So I have several articles here. Some of them are virtual, but a lot of them I have physically because I like to print them out and read them. And I'm just going to tell you what each article is about. All right, first, Brad Luckingham is one of the first emergent scholars on uh, Arizona history. He wrote in the 70s and 80s. He wrote Urban Development in Arizona, and he focuses on the end of the 19th century, so 1861 to 1970, so about 100 years of Phoenix history. He's really looking at, and think about, he's writing this in the 1980s, so he's got an old perspective on this because he was writing a long time ago. He's looking at modernity, boosterism, who was promoting the city and to whom, uh, the attraction of affluent suburbanites to, to Phoenix, water usage and canals. He dabbles a little in race relations, but primarily is interested in whiteness and some in Mexican influence. He looks at tourism, politics, agriculture, and like annexation programs, which is the buying of land by the city to bring in new urban territories. So if you're really interested in like the first hundred years, the early 20th century in Arizona history, take a look at Luckingham's work. Now, Whitaker, who was a um, student, I believe of Luckingham's, he writes the rise of black Phoenix. So while Luckingham's looking at the first hundred years, Whitaker's looking at that same kind of period, but he's really specifically interested in how the black community formed at the time. So he looks at black community formation and, and migration, like what brought black folks to Arizona. He says that this, that Phoenix is what's called a microcosm, meaning if you study Phoenix, you can understand the rest of the region. Um, and he looks at resistance and resilience among black leaders. He uh, identifies several early black leaders in uh, Phoenix history and white supremacy, as well as what's called de jure segregation. So like legal policies to segregate black people. Whitaker really looks at Phoenix north of the tracks. He's focused on the East Lake area. So if you know anybody from East Lake, uh, you might recognize it. And also Central Phoenix, uh, a little bit further north than what we focus on in the South Phoenix History Project. Now, maybe you're interested in that Japanese internment story I told you. So this is a little short piece by a person named uh, Mikiso Hain. And Hain writes wartime internment. He was a young Californian in 1942 who was sent to a concentration camp in Arizona, and he talks about life at that camp. So we were really interested in kind of a personal perspective. Koenig, Koenig writes Phoenix in the 1950s. So maybe you're really interested in kind of that mid-century era. He's looking at the post-war boom of a major Sunbelt suburban metropolis. So he's looking at how Phoenix exploded in the 1950s. In fact, he points out that Phoenix actually quadrupled in size, in size during that one decade. This is another older article, it's from 1982. And he's looking at how the government, the military, manufacturing and tourism really attracted outsiders to Phoenix. He dabbles a little in looking at like uh, technological advancements and he considers air conditioning to be one of those and federal involvement as well as the wealth and the middle class of the 1950s Phoenix. Um, Heim. Okay, so Carol Heim, she was also writing in the 1980s, I believe. No, I'm sorry. She was writing early 2000s, so more recent. Hers is called Leapfrogging Urban Sprawl and Growth Management in Phoenix. What she's interested in, this is from the Journal of Economics and Sociology, so it's less of a historical narrative and more of an analysis of how the city 
used different development methods to grow. So if you're like, how in the world did Phoenix become this enormous city? This is a great article for you. It's an economic history focusing on policies and corporate investment actions. So if you've ever wondered how Phoenix grew to the size it is in terms of sprawl, low density urbanization, this is a really good angle to consider. All right, Geography of Despair. This is by a group of researchers, including um, Bob Bolin. And this is really how South Phoenix is made through geographical and environmental racism. So if you're interested in kind of the, uh, again, that de jure use of segregationist policies to isolate people of color and remove them from access to social services, Bolin and his team really do a good job of this. Shirley Roberts writes, uh, Minority Group Poverty in Phoenix, a Socioeconomic Study. This is another picture of Jimmy Brooks's family. I believe Jimmy's right here. Yeah. So she's looking at kind of how the minority communities in Phoenix formed, and she's looking at the socioeconomic impacts of these communities. Mary Melcher wrote Blacks and Whites Together, Interracial Leadership in the Phoenix Civil Rights Movement. So maybe you're interested in how African-Americans were part of the civil rights movement in Phoenix. You know, the civil rights movement, we give a lot of credence to Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and rightly so, but they were East Coast, they were South, right? They were doing a lot of work in Washington, DC, and uh, Alabama, and New York. But what about people in desert states or the Sun Belt like Phoenix? We had activity here too. So her work is really interesting um, because she looks at how different Black leaders, in particular Clovis Campbell on the left and Reverend George Brooks on the right, how these folks were integrating their efforts using white uh, allies to form Phoenix's early civil rights movement. And then finally, uh, Oberly and Ariola, they write the resurgent black, or they resurgent Mexican Phoenix rather. And they're looking specifically at how Phoenix has been Mexican in culture from the beginning. Mexican people have, were part of Phoenix, Arizona's uh, makeup from the beginning, but that by the late 1990s, you actually see an increase in visibility and involvement among Mexican Phoenicians. This is a mural at post, post 41 in the Grant Park neighborhood. And this is a great example of kind of that resurgence. Uh, Hurt et al. Actually, if you're interested in like water, maybe you're like, how in the world is Phoenix sustaining itself when it's in the desert and we have millions of people living here? So they write uh, the Mirage in the Valley of the Sun. They look at the true economics of 3.7 million people drawing from a very limited water supply. They're looking from 1940s on. So this is later 20th century. Political developments around water in Phoenix and urban growth and the enduring optimism fueling the population boom in Arizona. So these are the articles that I just discussed. And I'll tell you what you're going to do next. But basically, those are all the full, full-ish citations. Now, here's your challenge. Using the library, select one of those articles I discussed. Now, I don't want you to Google these articles because you probably won't get access to the full article but I want you to use the library to find it. Then I want you to read and evaluate the article. And when ready, here's what I want you to post. I want you to share with us, what is the thesis or major claim this researcher is making? I gave you kind of a summary of the article, but what's the claim they're making? What major events, themes, or issues are they addressing? Is this more of a magic land or a reality, right? So are they talking about the magic lands that I discussed or are they giving us more kind of like a reality and a real, real analysis and how can you tell? And then finally, after reading this article, what do you notice and what do you wonder? Now, I wanna show you how to do that, okay? So I want you to use the library, like I said. Now, I want you to notice something. This is the library website, right? Let's say I'm interested in the Mary Melcher article. All right, Melcher, blacks and whites together, right? Click on it, keyword. Now I tried this this morning and I thought, oh, I gotta show my students. Look at that. Uh-oh, it's not here, panic. No. Every single one of these articles, and I'm leaving this in the video, so those of you who are watching the video, you're like, yes, Dr. C gave me the answer, okay? If you didn't watch the video, you might struggle. Okay, every single one of these articles I got from one database at the library. 
The reason I wanted to show you this is because I want you to see as honor students, as future graduate students, as future and current scholars, you have to know how to navigate something like a library. This one search I just used, this is our general search engine for the library. But I just typed in an article that I know the library has and it didn't work. Here's why. The library has access to like a hundred different databases. And each of these databases has access to like tens of thousands of sources. So just by using the library alone, you have more access to things on our library website than you ever would on Google. Google is a general search engine. It'll help you find like the, the it'll help you get started, but the database itself is gonna be much more focused. Now, I'm going to use JSTOR. So I'm gonna click on the database that's called JSTOR. Look at this. This whole database provides access to over 10 million scholarly journal articles, 10 million. So I'm gonna click on it and then I'm going to click Okay, you gotta let it wait, uh, load for a second. So when you click on this, don't freak out if you don't see a search bar, it takes a second. I'm gonna type the exact same search term, Melcher, blacks and whites together. <gasps> Look at that. So the library says it doesn't have it, but the library is wrong. So I'm gonna click on this and it's going to pull up Mary Melcher's article and now I can read it. And all I have to do is read it. And then what do I have to do? What is the thesis or major claim this researcher is making? What major events, themes, or issues are they addressing? Is she saying more of a magic land? Is this like a magic land thing or is it more of a reality thing? And what do I notice and what do I wonder? Now, you know what? I'm gonna add something here. I want you to read, cite, and evaluate the article. Now, okay. You can cite it by simply looking this, looking at the title and, and the information. Here's your author, here's your title, here's your location, and here's your date. But I've probably already showed you this before, but just in case, look here, click on cite. Oh my gosh, it's right there for you. You don't even have to do anything. You just right click copy and there you go. Okay, that's your challenge this week. Choose any one of those articles. It's fine if there's overlap. If you know someone else in the class chooses your article, that's fine. You can keep going. The only thing I ask is that you use your own evaluative efforts to post your answers. All right, everybody. I look forward to seeing what you have to say. I absolutely cannot wait uh, to see what you think about 20th century Arizona. All right, I'll see you later. Bye.